All right, good evening. <laughs> good evening. And welcome to Books and Books. My name is Ketsi, and I'm part of the children's department here at, obviously, Books and Books. Thank you all for joining us tonight, and thanks to our internet audience for tuning in with us. You're all in for a great treat for tonight, and you can keep up with our events online. And for those of you who are here, you can pick up a calendar at the register so you can enjoy many more of our author events. You can also follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. For those of you online, if you would like to purchase a book and have it personalized by Mr. Dave Barry, call the number on your screen and we will ship it to you wherever you are in the US. We look forward to hearing from you. It's been a great treat to have Dave Barry with us tonight. I have been reading his articles, his books, and even watched his TV show for many, many years. So it's been an honor to have him here at Books in Books, and it's wonderful to see how much a new generation he is inspiring and entertaining in his new comical book, The Worst Class Trip Ever. But let's have someone from the new generation do the honors. We will have Miss Elizabeth introduce Mr. Dave Barry. Good evening. Dave Barry is a very humorous writer. Read the first page of his new book, The Worst Class Trip Ever, and you'll already be smiling with, don't get me wrong, Matt is my best friend, but he can be an idiot. When we were in kindergarten, pretty much all the boys were idiots, so he didn't stand out so much, and we became best friends. So now, even though we're in the eighth grade, I'm kind of stuck with him. Or this line, I love my mom and my dad most of the time, but the older I get, the more I like to love them from a distance, if you know what I mean. Dave Barry's latest standalone novel, The Worst Class Trip Ever, is narrated by eighth grader Wyatt Palmer, who is attempting to impress the girl of his dreams while trying not to get sent home back to Miami from his school trip taking place in the nation's capital, Washington, D.C. Dave Barry is a Pulitzer Prize winner in commentary for his column in the Miami Herald and author of more than 30 books, including the children's adventure series Peter and the Star Catchers, which he co-wrote with Bradley Pearson. He is also a New York Times bestseller. It is with my pleasure that I introduce to you Dave Barry. Thank you. Oh, you don't need that? No. You're okay. Okay. <laughs> uh, and um, I'm going to assume. I said there's a new gen I'm, I'm writing for a new generation now, so I'm going to assume that not everybody knows who I am. Um, and so I'm going to show you a little bit of a slideshow of, of how I gra evolved into becoming uh, a writer of, of books for young adults, which may, might not even be such a great idea. Um, <laughs> but I'm enjoying it. Um, uh, for many years, I, I wrote a, uh, a column for the Miami Herald, and I still do write occasionally for the Miami Herald. In fact, I'll, I'll have a column about. Uh, Father's Day in the uh, Miami Herald on uh, Sunday. Um, and uh, so my job for a long time was to come up with something funny to write about. And uh, sometimes I would take it from the newspaper, but a lot of times I would do something and then I would write about it, just usually with something stupid. Um, and, and sometimes, speaking of Father's Day, it would involve uh, my children. This is why you don't ever want to have um, your father be a humor columnist. I know that if you're a kid, it's, you know, your parents are generally embarrassing enough anyway, but it's much worse if your father is a humor writer. For example, um, I once got a call at the Miami Herald from the Oscar Mayer Corporation uh, saying they were bringing the Oscar Mayer Wienermobile to Miami, and they like to get, you know the Wienermobile, right? It's a giant hot dog in a truck body with a loudspeaker. And uh, they like to get publicity for the Wienermobile. So they called me up at the Miami Herald and said, we're bringing the uh, Wienermobile to Miami. Well, would you like to drive it for a day? <laughs> and I said, sure. Uh, I knew exactly what I wanted to do. I wanted to pick my son up at middle school. <laughs> and there he is. That's, that's my son, Rob, when he was 12. Um, and he had just come out of the middle school. He, he's getting over the shock at this point, but there was all these moms in their mini, minivans, and, and then looming up behind was this giant hot dog with a loudspeaker going, Rob Berry, please report to the Wienermobile. So, <laughs> not a good day uh, for Rob. I feel I need to say something about this picture because um, about three weeks ago, 
uh, two weeks ago, uh, Rob, who is now a, a grown-up and has a son of his own, um, went to Columbia University as part of a team of reporters from the, uh, the Wall Street Journal to accept a Pulitzer Prize. So, oh yeah. So it obviously, it, it, as hard as I tried to damage him, I, I failed. Um, anyway, so that's, that's what, I, what I did for, for much of my career. I did stuff like that and I, and I wrote about it. Um, and then I started writing books and I wrote a bunch of books. Um, they're not, none of them, they're stupid books, really, many of them. Um, and the one bad thing, if you were young people out there who want to become authors, um, if you write humor books, the worst part of it is the cover photo because they always want to make it look funny. And, and, and that means you have to do things like pose like this. Um, I wrote a book about money once, and so they decided the cover should be this. Um, I wrote a, a book about um, Washington, D.C., and it was called Day Barry Hits Below the Beltway. So they decided the cover should be that. And the back was that. Um, Maybe the most embarrassing cover that I ever posed for, I wrote a book called uh, Day Barry is Not Taking This Sitting it Down. Sitting down. It really actually wasn't, I didn't write it, it was a collection of columns. And so the title though is Not Taking This Sitting Down. And the photographer's idea was, he said, I'm gonna, I'm gonna rent a tuxedo for you and I'm gonna get a toilet. And I'm gonna have you in, the, in an intersection in downtown Miami with the Miami skyline uh, behind you. That was his idea. That's, that's for you. Right? And, well, if it's for me. I, and and um, I actually didn't turn off my ringer now that I think of it. Um, that was me calling you, in fact. Um, and, and so I said to the, him, I, I said to the photographer, that's a really stupid idea. They're never going to go for that. Um, and that, in fact, became the cover. Um, and, this was one of the more interesting photo shoots I was ever involved in. It was on a weekend. This is on Flagler Street. Um, and the, the photographer didn't arrange. I thought, you know, like you would get a, a, a permit or something, but he didn't. I don't know what the permit would actually say in this case, to be honest. But, but so he, he goes out there and he's like, he waits till there's not a lot of traffic and puts the toilet down. And, and I pull my pants, you know, it's not, it's an awkward. And a cop does, shows up, and I'm thinking, we're going to get arrested here. And he goes, do you have a permit for this? And we go, no. And he goes, well, I better stay here. This is not the best neighborhood you're in here. Okay. <laughs> and, so, and so we had a police guarding us while we, while we did this, this photo shoot. Um, so anyway, so I'm writing books. Um, along about in the early 90s, I ended up... Um, some of my books were adapted for a TV show um, called Dave's World, which ran on CBS uh, for four years. And the, uh, the actor who was the, the star of the show, who played me, played Dave Barry, the columnist in Miami, was a guy named Harry Anderson um, from Night Court. Yeah. And, um, and Harry, so Harry Anderson was playing me. And they, I came out, actually was on the show once. Um, and at the end of the show, they had, we had a scene where Harry Anderson and I played um, the guitar together. Oh, there we are. That's me on the left and Harry Anderson on the right playing guitar. He's a horrible guitar player, um, <laughs> but a very funny guy. Um, and I bring up the guitar because um, the, the, I, I play in an all-author uh, rock band um, <laughs> ca called, called the Rock Bottom Remainders, which uh, so, has performed fairly often in Miami at the Miami... A book fair. Um, among the members of the band are there's uh, Amy Tan and Stephen King, um, and we also have Roy Blunt Jr., uh, Scott Turow, Ridley Pearson, Greg Isles, uh, a bunch of bunch of pretty good uh, writers in the band. But we're not a good band <laughs> in terms of the musical part of the band. Um, and uh, I'm going to show you a photo that illustrates why I say that. This next photo was taken at the uh, Los Angeles Festival of Books. Um, we're playing, and there's a member of the audience reacting to our music. Um, <laughs> as many authors do. I mean, many uh, our audience members do. Um, so that's me there. The guy on the left in that picture is Ridley Pearson, who is our bass player. And um, he is the reason I ended up writing uh, books for kids. Um, what happened was Ridley, was, he's a thriller writer. 
and he's been a thriller writer for many years, very successful. Um, what, one day the band was playing in, in Miami, at the Miami Book Fair, and Ridley, who's a good friend of mine, was staying in our house, and he said to me, I was reading Peter Pan to my daughter Paige, and uh, she had an idea for a book, basically. She, she didn't put it that way, but she said, how did Peter Pan meet Captain Hook in the first place? And, uh, and really thought about it, and nobody ever really, I mean, Jan Barry doesn't explain that. It just starts out, Peter Pan's on an island, he can fly, he never grows old, there's mermaids, there's uh, this, this crocodile. And so Ridley said to me, I was thinking of writing a prequel to Peter Pan. I, and I said, that's, that's a really cool idea. And he said, well, would you like to do it with me, since neither one of us really knew how to do that. Um, and he said, yeah. I mean, I said, yeah. Uh, and so we thought we were going to write a little book. Um, we really did. We thought we were going to write a short book, and that was going to be it. And we didn't even have a publisher when we came up with the idea. We ended up writing a book called Peter and the Star Catchers, yeah. which is a, thanks, which is not a little book. It's like over 500 pages. Um, it was published by Disney, and it did very well, and it, it, was, uh, it was quite successful. So we, we ended up, we, we thought, let's write a trilogy. The, Disney really wanted a trilogy. That's a big deal to write three books. So we, we wrote a second book. Um, <laughs> actually, that wasn't our second book. We, we, we wrote, um, um, that, was, that was our third book, and this is called uh, Peter and the Secret of Run, uh, the, the Secret of Rundoon. Um, and I should have set this up better than I did, but this happened in this room. Um, we were standing over here, and the room was packed, full of kids on the floor. Ridley and I were reading a scene from Peter and the Secret of Rundoon, and the scene involved a giant snake. Mitchell Kaplan, where is Mitchell? There he is. Mitchell, come in here and explain what happened. <laughs> Mitchell Kaplan is the owner of Books and Books, and. What, what happened in this picture, Why Mitchell? Why don't you help me with this thing? Okay. Because my memory is going as Okay. Well. Mitchell hired a guy, a snake wrangler. He, he thought it would be fun to surprise Ridley and me. He didn't tell us he was doing this. That's true. He thought it would be fun to have a guy with a, a snake come in while we're reading the scene about the snake. And he, he hired this guy. Well, you don't see the guy. No, but you see the snake. But, like, where, I don't know where you found him. Like, Craigslist? Do you look up snake? Anyway. Yeah, he was just walking down the street. Yeah, so, snake. you know those guys who walk around with the snake? He hired one of those guys who comes in and puts the snake on our shoulders. Right. And so we're standing here, and in this picture, we're trying to look like this is fun for us. <laughs> and I was checking my insurance policy to see if it covered two dead off. Yeah. <laughs> I wasn't sure the snake, it. it weighed 90 pounds. It's a, it, was a, it was about a 10-foot-long 90-pound snake. And it's like clearly trying to decide there which one of us is going to eat. And we're, we're trying to act like we're having a lot of fun here. But we're really thinking, like, did we, did we bring spare underwear to the, to the So Thank you, Mitchell Kaplan. Our, so, so that was an that was, uh, exciting moment. We had a, a few other. I'll just run through quickly some other exciting things we, we have had happen to us because of uh, the Peter and the Starcatchers books. Um, Ridley and I have done, did, did a, because uh, it was a Disney book, we did a number of events at Disney World, um, and they're, they're great, they really are great, they, they do wonderful events. Um, they never put a snake on you. Um, <laughs> we did an event with Peter Pan and Captain Hook um, at uh, the Contemporary Resort. That's, that's, that was what happened that day. Um, we, we had this giant signing with a bunch of people there, and this, this was taken after it was over. They had Peter and, and Captain Hook kind of dancing around behind us, dueling and everything. Before the signing, uh, Ridley and I were in a, a staging area, like a, really a locker room backstage while they assembled the crowd and organized things. So, and I don't know where Captain Hook was, but it was Ridley and me and Peter Pan. This guy you see here, like wiry guy in tights, um, in this fairly small room waiting to go on. And we're there for about 15 minutes. And it's a little awkward, you know, Ridley me, Peter Pan. And he's just kind of standing there like, you know. So I, thinking to break the ice, said to him, so how do you like working here? And this, he said, I'm not making this up, he said, it's a beautiful day in Neverland. <laughs> Have you seen Wendy? 
And we're like, no, no, dude. We have, we have not seen Wendy because we're, we're in a locker room with you. Um, we're not actually in Neverland. Um, but as you may know, if you are a Disney character and you're wearing the costume, you must remain in character. So you cannot say anything that character wouldn't say. You cannot do anything that character wouldn't do. And it turns out Peter Pan, great guy, love him. Doesn't have a lot to say. Uh, beautiful day, basically, is what he's got to say. So you talk about a long 15 minutes. Um, try hanging out with Peter Pan. Um, we also were chosen, Ridley and I, this was a big honor, we were assured, as to be the, uh, the grand marshals of the, of the Main Street electrical parade, the Main Street Parade, the, the, new, the, the midday parade, which I'm, I'm sure most of you have been to Disney World, you know that in the middle of the day, they, 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 op they kind of uh, close off a parade, a parade route, everybody gathers around it, and they send these um, uh, floats through the park with all the Disney characters. That parade is led by an antique fire truck, and the people sitting on the fire truck are the grand marshals chosen for the day. And you, you, you have a Disney character with you. Um, and so we, we were chosen, Ridley and I, to be the, the Main Street uh, uh, Parade um, grand marshals. And um, Michelle, my, my wife, and our daughter Sophie was over there. We're, we're on the, with us in the Pearson family. And, um, and Clarabelle the Cow was our Disney. <laughs> it's not really an A-list um, <laughs> character, but they don't, you know, the rest of them are in the, the parade. So, she's, so they were in this staging area with this big gate in front of us. And behind us are all the floats that are in the parade. And, um, and they're telling us there are 50,000 people out there. And they're very excited to see you. And when they see the fire truck, they know the parade is, is coming. So wave and smile, and it's going to be great. And they give us Mickey Mouse ears to wear um, and send us out. And they sent us out um, on this parade route. And there, the only thing is there was a problem with the float that was supposed to lead the parade. Right behind us, that float didn't move. It had something wrong with it. So they sent us out, but nobody followed us. <laughs> So there's 50,000 people waiting for the parade, and here we come. <laughs> so here we come, and there's no parade behind us. And so here's, here, whoop, whoop, here, whoa, there's a picture of um, us, Ridley and I, with our ears. Notice the crowd. If you, you can find anybody looking excited in that crowd, they're like, where's, that's it? <laughs> These dorks and Clarabelle, that's the parade, you know? <laughs> So we go through and disappoint like 50,000 people. And it, like, we got all the way through, got off, and got to watch the parade. It came 10 minutes behind us. So that was, that was a downer. Um, the, the, uh, the next picture is uh, one, of the, one of the highlights of, of our, I've given you some of the lowlights, but one of the highlights was um, we got a, a, an email from a woman named Katie Coleman who said she wanted permission from us to take our, our books with her on a trip so that she could read them by Skype to her kids. And the reason she needed our permission was that she is an astronaut. Um, so, you know, and I, I realized that that's supposed to be rotated, but then I also realized it doesn't matter, you know? <laughs> as far as she's concerned, who can? So yeah, this is Katie Coleman, and she's reading a book we wrote called Science Fair um, to her kids back on Earth um, in space, which was pretty neat. She called Ridley, Ridley's family and my family from space. And it's really, it's very, the sound just like a call from next door. It's very, it's very neat to talk to the space day, except for that when she gets out of the other side of the earth, you can't hear her anymore, um, which I hate that, don't you? I mean, it's like, <laughs> but um, the, I just have to tell you, Sophie and, and Michelle and I uh, got this call and th they both talked to her. And we were in a restaurant um, in Miami when we got the call. Can you guess what restaurant we were at when we got a call from space? Nope. It was a really appropriately named restaurant. Not Planet Hollywood, that's close. Sturma. <laughs> Johnny Rockets. Yeah. So, so that's where we were. So anyway, um, 
anyway, all that is kind of um, preface to what I want to talk about, which is how I ended up um, writing um, the book, the class trip book, um, which I'll put back up here, I hope. There. Um, and th I got the idea for this book um, when, when I, I, Michelle and I were chaperoning a class trip. Our daughter Sophie goes to school here. She goes to public schools in, in Miami. And uh, when she was a, a student at, at Carver uh, Middle School, that's, that's right. So I'm, thank God for my wife being here. When she was at Sunset <laughs> Elementary School, it, did I get her name right? It is Sophie. <laughs> yeah. And that's actually the whole point of my column on, on Sunday, which is that we really shouldn't have Father's Day. The only reason we have it is because we have Mother's Day, but really we're not nearly as good at this as they are, you know? <laughs> so, you know, and anyway, um, so Sophie was uh, in fifth grade, finished fifth grade at, at Sun Elementary, and she's in a Spanish uh, magnet program. So they, it's a very cool class trip. They go to Spain. Um, so we went to Spain uh, with Sophie and, and a bunch of kids. And, um, but I, it occurred to me, that there's something really wrong with the system where they send kids far away with people like me in charge. Um, <laughs> worrisome thing. Um, and I don't mean to single this dad out and say he was a bad dad. He's actually a great dad. His kid is a wonderful kid. But we had, and back me up on this, Michelle, we had a, a dad who, whose wife tr dropped, us off, dropped them off at the airport and she leaves her husband in charge of their son to go on this trip. And her, her, her son's arm was in a cast. He had broken his arm. When we brought that child back from Spain, his leg was also in a cast. <laughs> right? Am I, am I not? I am not lying here. Um, so, in other words, I, I thought, well, you know, uh, things could go wrong on a class trip. So I, I, tr I try to come up with a plot involving a class trip where things go drastically wrong. And I, and I wrote the worst class trip ever. Um, and I'm going to read a little bit of it to you. Um, and this is, this is sort of introducing the, the narrator of the book, who's a kid named Wyatt Palmer. He's an eighth grader at Culver, Culver Middle School. No connection with Carver <laughs> Middle School, where my daughter went. Um, and they go to, they go to Washington, D.C. Anyway, his name is Wyatt Palmer. He's an eighth grader. He's going to be the narrator of the book. And this is the, near the very beginning when he's sort of explaining a little bit about himself and his family and about the city of Miami. My name is Wyatt Palmer. I'm an eighth grader at Culver Middle School in Miami. I know a lot of people think Miami is a weird place, but it's my home, so I'm used to the kind of things that happen there that don't happen in normal places. Like there was this incident that happened about six months ago when my dad went outside to get the Miami Herald off our lawn. My dad likes to read the sports section while he has his coffee so he can complain about how much the dolphins suck. <laughs> so the first thing every morning, he goes outside and gets the paper off the lawn. For years, he did this wearing only his boxers. My mom hated this. She was always telling my dad to at least put on a bathrobe because what if somebody saw him? My dad said nobody's going to be out there at 6.30 a.m. And besides, wearing boxer shorts is the same as wearing a bathing suit. This is not really true, especially if you saw my dad's bedtime boxers, which have like zero elastic and a lot of holes, and according to my mom, are held together mainly by stains. <laughs> a couple of times she threw them away, but my dad went back and got them back out of the trash. He's very loyal to his boxers. By show of hands, how many men here have gone into the trash and retrieved your boxers that your wife has thrown away? Okay. So anyway, this particular morning, my dad went outside as usual to get the paper, and as usual, our dog, Zonka, stood in the doorway to watch him. Zonka likes to keep an eye on things, but he knows he's not allowed to go outside without a leash. Anyway, my dad was out there bending over to pick up the newspaper, which, trust me, you do not want to see. <laughs> and all of a sudden, Zonka started barking like crazy. My dad jumped up and turned around, and he was about to yell at Zonka to shut up, when all of a sudden, he saw what Zonka, what Zonka was barking at. <laughs> An alligator. <clears throat> we live near a canal. 
There's canals all over Miami, and they connect to the Everglades, which means if you live here, you basically live in a swamp. I mean, we have houses and roads and shopping centers and stuff, but it's all built on top of a swamp. And as far as the swamp animals are concerned, it's still a swamp, and it's still theirs. It's normal for us to see snakes in our yards and lizards and all kinds of frogs and big, tall wading birds, and every now and then an alligator shows up. This particular alligator, which was not a small alligator, was on our lawn maybe 10 feet from our front walkway, which means my dad went right past without seeing it on his way to the newspaper. <laughs> but he definitely saw it when Zonka started barking, and no way was he going to try to walk past it again. He started yelling, Rosa, Rosa, calling my mom. She and my sister Taylor and I all went running to the door to see what was going on. My dad was out on the sidewalk holding up his boxers with one hand and using the other one to point the Miami Herald at the alligator like it was a weapon or something. My mom screamed and so did Taylor and maybe I also made an unmanly noise because it really was a pretty major alligator. Call 911, shouted my dad. Hurry! Okay, said my mom, running to the kitchen. By now Zonka was really going crazy barking. He was also out of the house which was a violation of the leash rule, but I guess he figured it was pre he was protecting my dad. What he was really doing was upsetting the alligator, which started to move forward in that slow way alligators walk. I think it was going for Zonka, but it was moving kind of in the direction of Taylor and me. So my father came running down the walk, waving the Miami Herald toward the alligator and going, shoo, get away! <laughs> that was definitely the bravest thing I ever saw my dad do, but it did not impress the alligator. What it did was make the alligator turn more in the direction of my dad, who turned right around and went sprinting back toward the sidewalk. <laughs> Run in a zigzag pattern, shouted Taylor. <laughs> the reason she shouted that was, in Florida, some people believe alligators can only run in a straight line. So they tell kids that if a gator is chasing them, they should run in a zigzag pattern. But it's a myth. In fifth grade, my science teacher, Mrs. Bunce, showed us a video of an alligator chasing a dead chicken being dragged by a guy in a zigzag pattern, and the gator had no trouble following it. <laughs> Mrs. Bunce said you should run in a straight line. That's a myth, I shouted to my dad. Run in a straight line. <laughs> Are you trying to kill him, yelled Taylor, punching my arm. She's in sixth grade and very dramatic. The truth was, my dad couldn't hear either one of us because of Kazanka's barking, which was getting even louder. The alligator was now standing right on the walkway, and Zonka was getting pretty close to it, which was not good because alligators, besides being able to zigzag, can also move really fast when they want to. The one in Mrs. Bunce's video caught the chicken and almost caught the guy dragging it. The police came pretty fast, three cars in like two minutes. They stopped in the street in front of our house with their lights flashing. All the neighbors came out of their houses to see what was going on. Also, commuters were stopping their cars to watch. The police got out of their cars, but didn't get too close to the alligator, which was still watching Zonka, who was still barking. So everybody just stood around for a few minutes while more commuters stopped their cars. So by now, there was a pretty big crowd out there with my dad. Finally, some animal control officers showed up. They're used to alligators on people's lawns, and they handled this one in like five minutes. They snagged it with a noose, duct taped its mouth shut, and took it away in a van. The neighbors went back inside, and the commuters drove away, and Zonka finally shut up and it was all over except for my mom reminding my dad that she told him not to wear his boxers outside. <laughs> but did he listen? No, he did not listen, et cetera, et cetera, like 650 times. That night when we were eating dinner, I got a text from a kid in my class saying, Channel 4 now, LOL. So we turned on the kitchen TV, and there was our house in a cell phone video one of the commuters took. You could see the gator, and there was a nice close-up of my dad <laughs> holding up his holy boxers with his belly sagging down. I said, real good look, Dad. My dad said, they can't show that without my permission, can they? Taylor said, I'm going to skip school for the rest of my life. <laughs> my mom didn't say anything, which was not like her. She just stared at the TV until the alligator story was over. Then she got up and walked out of the kitchen. About a minute later, we heard the patio door open and close. We went to look, and there was my mom on the patio next to the pool, standing over my dad's boxers, which were on fire. <laughs> when they were totally burned up, 
She splashed some spool, pool water on the ashes and walked back into the house, right past my dad, not saying a word. I don't know if they talked about it later. I do know that the next morning, when he went out to get the paper, he wore a bathrobe. <laughs> no. No. Thank you. So anyway, that's the beginning of it. That's introducing the kid, Wyatt Palmer, who's going to be the main character in the story. And he gets, the story sort of starts with their getting on a plane at Miami International Airport and heading uh, for Washington, D.C., where they're going to see all kinds of sites, including, of course, uh, the White House, which ends up playing a key role in the, the plot. Um, not long bef after, or before this book was published, it was published in May, there were a couple of incidents involving um, the White House. Um, the, there were, uh, there's concern about the aerial safety over the White House. You remember this guy? <laughs> what state was he from? <laughs> People from other states, they write a letter, you know? <laughs> Not people from Florida. So he, this guy landed a gyrocopter. He, he actually didn't go to the White House. He went to the Capitol. But it, shortly before that, there was a drone, you may recall, at the White House. So there was a lot of concern about an aerial attack on the White House. And I had, didn't, I mean, I'm not going to give myself credit for anticipating that. But the plot of this book does involve an aerial uh, approach to the White House, not involving a gyrocopter or a drone, but involving a dragon kite. Um, <laughs> There's a big kite festival uh, that takes place every year uh, in the ellipse next to the White House. And, I, and these are, some of these are very large kites capable of lifting a human being. So I had this idea for what could happen if a, you know, a kite got over the... Anyway, that's where the idea for the plot came. And I, I incorporated a number of Washington um, sites in the, in the book, uh, monuments and in buildings like the Smithsonian and, and the uh, National Archives and so on. I also, because I, I think this is the weirdest single thing in Washington, D.C., included the, uh, the Boy Scout Memorial. Um, is anybody here familiar with the Boy Scout Memorial? Yeah, okay. I think it's the weirdest single thing in Washington, D.C., and I'm including Congress in that statement. <laughs> I'm going to show you a picture of the Boy Scout Memorial, and you may see why I chose that I had to include it in. Okay. What is wrong with this picture? <laughs> it's a Boy Scout moment because there's a Boy Scout in it. I get that. Yeah. Then there's the lady to the Boy Scouts left. Okay, I'm okay with that, I guess. Why is there a giant naked man <laughs> walking with the Boy Scouts? Uh, like, he, he better be prepared, you know? Like, so anyway, that, that, it turns out, plays a, a major role. In fact, I was so in love with that statue, it made it to the cover of the book. <laughs> you see it below there in the cover, and then there's the big dragon kite on the upper right. Uh, upper left is a butt kite. There's a kite shaped like a butt, because um, why not? Uh, butt kite <laughs> plays a role in the, uh, in, the, in the story. So anyway, that gives you, that's uh, basically what, how, I came, how I came to end up writing this book. Um, and there's the cover. So uh, I don't know how much time, who's in charge? Not me, I hope. <laughs> we have a little bit of time? OK. Um, I'd be happy to take uh, questions if anybody has questions. Yes? Uh, Dave, thank you so much for all your writings. It's wonderful. Oh, thank you. My, my question goes back to Disney. If Disney were to do Soren for South Florida, what would they include? Hi, Aaliyah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that would be actually cool. That's actually, they need to do something because that's California and it's at least like 30 years ago. They had water then. Um, the soaring. Has anybody been on the soaring ride? It's the, oh, yeah. it, one of the coolest rides at Epcot. Um, but yeah, I think they should do, you know, like the, the Palmetto Expressway. <laughs> you know, maybe do, uh, uh, what is that? Oh man, I'm blanking on the name of the the mu music festival where everybody does drugs. Ultra. Ultra. You wouldn't even need to get in the thing. You would just <laughs> soar, you know. Ultra. Yes. Um, it's a personal question. When did you first know you were funny? When did I first know I was funny? Well, when you guys started laughing tonight. Up to, <laughs> I'm pretty nervous. No. Um. I, 
I always was that kid, you know, who had to make his friends. La I didn't have any other skills. I was not a good athlete. I was a little puny. Huh? I was elected class clown, Pleasantville High School class of 1965. I will be there at our 50th reunion in two weeks. But I was actually elected class clown, male class clown. We had a female class clown. That, that would be Tony Flood. I'm assuming you know that. Um, only Judy got that joke. All right. The, there really was, never mind. Um, but yeah, I, but I always, you know, that's how I related to people. And, and I, I, did, I like to be, my, my family was, I had a very funny family. My parents really enjoyed humor. So in our family, the way to get people's attention was to, to make jokes. And so we did. We made jokes about everything in my family. So I, I don't I remember any specific time, but I always wanted to be funny, you know. You're welcome. Anybody else? Yeah. Is there any relationship between the person Taylor in this book and Taylor in Lunatics? Is there, oh, is there any relationship between? No, you're right. There's, I don't know. I'm just not good enough to think of two <laughs> girls named Taylor without naming one of them, both of them Taylor. You're right. That's pretty true. I'm trying to think of a, like a fairly modern name, you know, uh, for a girl. But that's that was that's pathetic. Thank you for pointing that out. <laughs> In my defense, your father's a bad man for letting you read that book, Lunatics. <laughs> this one is okay to read. You should never have read the other one. Um, yes? Uh, but, but besides the obvious, it, is, is, is Gulliver a cat kind of based on Gulliver? On Gulliver? No, it's not based on Gulliver. It's based on Carver. <laughs> Carver was, is also a school. Gulliver's a fine school, don't get me wrong. But my daughter went to uh, Carver, so I'm... But it's not really based on that. Anything, in, it's coincidental. Uh, <laughs> yes? When you're writing a book, is it a good idea to try writing about a place you're not really familiar with, as in your own hometown? Um, when you're writing a book, is it, is it a good idea to write a place you're not familiar with as opposed to your hometown? You know, the old saying is you write what you know. I, I have written several novels. They've always been based in Miami or in this case, Miami and Washington, D.C., but I'm pretty familiar with uh, Washington, D.C. I would be pretty uncomfortable writing about a place I'd never been or didn't know anything about. People do it all the time. Thanks to the Internet, it's amazing how much you can, you can find out. I wrote about uh, uh, one of the, one of the um, Star Catchers book was We set it in London, most of it. But we went to London, Ridley and I, because it was tax deductible to do that. <laughs> and, and we did actually check out all the places that we wrote about. I would just feel a little funny writing about a play. I'll, I'll let you in on a little. <coughs> oh, there it is. I'm going to get the water. Thank you. Um, I will let you in a little secret of, of fiction writing, though, that when you first write fiction, you think that every reader is going to be aware of every little possible logical inconsistency. And, and the truth is, you can't write a book without having some kind of logical inconsistencies or things that just don't make sense when you really think about them, or that could not possibly be. They never notice any of that. <laughs> um, I, I had a w wonderful conversation with a um, famous novelist who uh, I'm not going to name, but he said, the first book I wrote, you know, it went out, it did well. and." Um, and then, like, like a year later, a guy comes up to me and goes, "Did anybody ever ask you like how the gun got there? Because it couldn't have been there." He goes, "Oh my god!" <laughs> and, I, and like at that point, three million people have read this book. One person noticed it; nobody else ever ever noticed. So, um, you find that you can, I as long as you kind of create a believable enough narrative and world, the reader goes along with it and doesn't worry too much about minor logical, if you say a character suddenly decides to do this, unless it's really ridiculous, the readers will say, yeah, you just decided to do that, which makes it you know, easier to write the book <laughs> than if you have to actually figure out what people would really do all the way through. I have no idea what question I'm answering anymore. <laughs> yes? Who's your favorite author? Who's my favorite author? Um, of all time, it's a, he's a dead. Um, Robert Benchley was his name. He was a very funny guy. 
who wrote in the 20s and 30s and 40s, and, and my, it happens that my father was a big fan of his and had his books, and he wrote these silly essays, but they were brilliant. And when I was a kid, I discovered these and started reading them, and I thought, wow, I love this. I want to do this. And it's really kind of what I ended up um, doing. So he is my absolute favorite author, uh, Robert Benchley. And the weird thing is, very few people even remember him now and know anything about him, which has always been a good lesson for me because that will be me eventually. And I, you, no, no, really, if you write humor, it's, you know, it only has a, a certain life. Where there's a, a certain you know, culture that you're in where everybody gets the same jokes and then it goes away, you know, and, and a new culture arises. So, yeah. How did the boy break his leg? That's a good question. Um, bad chaperoneship. Um, really, I mean, it's the true answer. Um, we, we went to this place that had a really steep hill. And of course, the girls looked at the hill and then went on and looked at the thing they were supposed to. The boys immediately all started running down the hill, pushing each other down the hill, diving down the hill. And he's got you know broken arms, so he should, probably should. But he's a boy. So he's, oh, yeah, what could possibly go wrong here? And he, <laughs> off he goes. And Michelle and I actually tried to say, boys, said, someone's going to get hurt here. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, that hoo, hoo, hoo. And that's how he broke his leg. The answer is, boys are idiots. And I used to be one. <laughs> I used to be one. Yes. So my daughter's live streaming, and she couldn't come. What's her name? Sky, well, I don't even know where the camera is, but. So she Hi, Sky. <laughs> Hi, Sky. Yeah. As a matter of fact, having said Sky a few times, she wants to offer her name if you need another four girl. How does she spell Sky? S K Y E. Okay. Is that a real name or is that like some 60s hippie Works thing? Oh, really? That's like, okay. Did they? Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D.? Okay, well, if Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. used it, <laughs> good enough for me. Yeah. Yes. How long does it typically take you to do the book? How many drafts? How many? How long does it take? Well, uh, ten to fifteen minutes. Um, <laughs> thanks to spell check, you know. You just, now, you know, if you don't do anything else, if you just write, um, three months to six months, you know. I mean, the hardest part of writing a book, a fiction, is the plot. It's not the writing. It's the how. What's going to happen next part? Um, unless you're really, really amazingly good at outlining everything in advance, which I'm not. Um, you used to spend a lot of time thinking. Um, but, but once you start writing, it's generally, you know, it's not that long. Um, the, the thing is, I'm always doing something else, so it, it really takes me more like a year just because I'm writing other things. Um, yeah? Um, I'm a fifth grade teacher, and actually we do a trip to Washington with our students every year. Um, I find that now it's even, it becomes more and more challenging every year to fight the uh, smartphone And what's you think I have an answer? What's your <laughs> how, do we, how do we keep them reading? I don't know. I may, my daughter's over here, you know, on Instagram right now, probably. She's not even listening. <laughs> um, I, I, I hear you, as, and as a parent, I, I couldn't agree with you more. I don't know. I don't know what the answer is. I, I do think that if, you know, kids will, they will read. They'll get, I mean, it's not going to take them away from their phones. They'll read, and then they'll, you know. But um, I don't think you can make them put the phone down anymore because it is their, it's their life, you know? It's their life in a, in a, in a way that I, I can almost not relate to, you know? My, on the other hand, I had like five friends when I was growing up. My daughter has 16,000 friends, you know? <laughs> and she has to keep track of them all, so it's a big job. It's a big job. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, you asking a question, you're just standing up. Okay. Well, are we. Any other questions? Hey, well, thank you all for coming out. And thank you, Books and Books. Before we all get up, wait for one moment. Thank you. All right, for all of you on the internet, um, if you would like to get a personalized copy, call the number on your screen, and we will have it shipped over to you. All For all of you who are here, if you already have purchased the book, 
You will exit this way through the curtain through the cafe. You're going to make a left, and then you're going to make another left into the other room. When you get to Lejeune. (laughs) 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 And Mr. Dave Barry will be there to sign. If you have not purchased the book, they are behind the register to the left, behind right here. Thank you, and have a great night. Thank you.